Welcome back everyone to Tianova Lost Cities of Europe in which I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, and we are watching the world around us kind of completely burning to the ground. But such is life. We gotta read about Tata Hate though. One of millions, a man steps out of the streets of Guangdong. His story is unremarkable, almost cookie cutter, and like many others, he now joins the thousands of protesters that now line the lanes of the Perur. The impoverished, the laid off, the disloyal, and all those hated by our chief executive are now making their voices heard, marching in unison. A mass of people so large, no riot control or military detachment has been able to stop their way. Recruiting anyone willing, people rush out of their homes to join. As their demands have become so much more than simply repealing austerity measures, the public, particularly the Chinese public, are unmoving in their hate of the government. Originally starting as a protest organized by the radicals of the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen and the Chinese Committee on Labor, peoples of all walks of life have joined them, with the protesters accepting all those who stand in opposition against their state. Triggered by our actions during the oil crisis, the opposition to our government has become united and their demands made clear. Komai must go no matter the cost, austerity measures need to be repealed, security restrictions must be lifted, and the tariffs must be removed from power. Like ants, they march in union and blissfully unaware of how Guangdong deals with those who threaten her. Violence is right, with elites opposed to the demands of the protesters being assaulted if they dare go out on the streets. They make clear they're willing to fight for freedom, even if they hang for it. As they march throughout the Pearl River Delta, singing old national hymns and new revolutionary rhymes, it's become increasingly pre prevalent that our time to act is now. These have become more than a simple protest or worker demonstration. They have forgotten their place in society, and now have shown that they have no business participating in it. This has become a matter of national security. We must act quickly to call this blight, lest our government become a footnote of history. Flumes turn to flames and no-go zones. Oh, that'd be pretty good to do. To do corn off the streets. Yeah, this one. As our chief executive begins to enact severe security measures to expand the rot of the protesters, our priorities need to be correct. Our police force, union to the IJA station within Guangdong, will be sent to secure certain locations on the sites, which are considered important and essential to Guangdong's administrative and economic apparatus. These zones will be heavily reinforced with the latest equipment and riot control measures, ensuring that unpermitted entry would simply not be possible under any circumstance. These buildings are to be government offices, corporate headquarters, and certain manufacturing plants, places which absolutely cannot be relinquished to the barbaric horde. We'll keep ensure that our most viable assets are kept safe and protected. The magnificence of Guangdong is at state, but we demand quiet. Sushida. Kuni Xiao. Kuni Yasu uh, maintained his composure in front of the chief executive. He watched him read the report on his desk, studying his face with the same twitch of fear Tsushida felt when he read it. Here was a tale of discontent and anger. A tale being written daily on the street to the Three Pearls. Every week there was a new protest against the government, their frequency and severity increasing every week. Kumai closed the floor after a thorough reading and looked up at Tsushida, waiting a response. The situation is going out of hand, chief executive. He stood straight, stiff and assuring. Most of these protests don't escalate beyond screaming slogans, but when some of our men break ranks to deal with a rioter, they get dragged into the mob. I know of at least one man who didn't make it out alive. So I read, Commissioner, he pushed a forward across the desk. You are dealing with these riders appropriately? Yes, Chief Executive. Those responsible for being, are being punished, but for every rider we throw in Stanley. And for every rider buried under Stanley uh, Tsushida, another three spring up and more violent than the last. Kamai said nothing. He sort of walked to the window. The lights were still on in the three prowls, but in the distance he could see smoke outside the factories. A fire in Guangdong. A reflection loomed large over her. Every second this continues uh, is a blemish is on your department, Sushida. Get your men together and get the pest in line. Loosen the chains. Pull the fear of God on them. Kill them if you must. In a week's time, I want there to be no more talk of riots. The streets will be peaceful, whether by your hand or your successors. Let's see. Decrease the Chinese government support? Okay. I do not want to increase Japanese frustration, so aim non lethal rounds at GFT. Decrease Japanese frustration. Increase radicalism and decrease strength, yeah. Push back the GFT with armored cars. Increase government control? Yes. That's why so much political power. Decrease Japanese frustration and increase radicalism? Yeah. We do all that stuff. I don't want to do this one because I just don't want to increase Japanese frustration because I'm sure they're going to get very frustrated with us. Like, we're very frustrated with, with them sometimes. So, Other than that, we're doing okay. Not an inch. <laughs> increase the government's despair, huh? The strength, yeah. It is a hell of a necessity that we make these protests in, protesting ingrates and good for nothings understand the reality of the situation. We, the government, are right. They're completely in the wrong. We cannot err and we don't admit no faults. We don't admit faults. They are not alone. We, they alone are capable of error. We will not acknowledge the existence of the so called right to protest and what, what they, in their benign, uh, subhuman ignorance, think is wrong. They're beneath us and we're above them. This shall it always remain. For the continued beauty and wealth for the city of Guangdong demands it, there will be no reforms, no opening up, no amount of flowers shall be permitted to bloom in this country while the infallible chief executive Komai rules. Let this be made clear before we send the police out in the streets. Let them be warned here and now, everywhere they can hear the rightful chief executive speak, surveying the situation. Sitting in a small office alone, Kamai flicked through a number of reports laid out <clears throat> on his desk concerning the recent riots. It had been 30 days since they had begun, and there was no signs of things calming down, and the reports were each as bad as the next. Violence, lootings, cop killings, and worst of all, destruction of property. His fist clenched as he looked over everything, driven more by anger than anxiety. The riots felt like an insult to himself and his autonomy, a challenge to him that he needed to rise to. 
Kamai mulled over the best way to proceed, idly turning to the window and gazing out of the horizon as he did so. He could see telltale elements of the disorder below. Empty streets, barricades, destruction. He wanted to take over the situation as much as he could and really prove himself to both the riders and his benefactors in Manchukuo. A possibility that seemed increasingly viable as he thought it over. Guang Dong had already received a lot of support from Manchukuo. It should be no problem to crush the riders in the competition and turn the territory to prosperity. Turning back to his desk, Kamai began typing on his typewriter. He would have things sorted out all in and all under his leadership. Guangdong belongs to Kamai. Through compromises in diplomacy, the chief executive will rule Guangdong in an image that Nissan and Manchuria desires. A quiet night in Macau. Falling a breathe of relief as he punched in for his night shift, nodding wordlessly to the security of the desk before trading street clothes for his own uniform, even though he had to hurry through a few checkpoints. He managed to avoid the worst of the street clashes, melting into the background before attracting the attention of either the protesters or the police. <coughs> He took up the assigned position outside two warehouses facing the waterfront, and in an unremarkable corner of one of Macau's cargo ports. Guangdong's nightly chaos seemed utterly remote here, an oasis of calm surrounded by once fire wire fencing and corporate security, which suited Fang just fine. Um, I think I read this one before, actually, so if you don't read this one, continue reading this one, please go ahead. Quiet forevermore. You can hear the fire sirens in the distance, even though they have never seemed to grow louder. The pain was mercifully fading. So, I might not have, but if you want to read this one, this is kind of a generic one. There you go. The Man at the Threshold. As they exited their home, Chen checked everything one last time. He'd take a large bag, the note explaining that the situation was on the table, and most importantly, his family was still asleep. Since the sun hadn't risen yet, he didn't feel ready still, so he stepped out of the door, he paused, stealing himself for the task ahead. When the riots end and the CCL wins, he thought, I'll be back, but doubt seeped in almost immediately after those words. <clears throat> there was no guaranteed success at all. He realized immediately that this may be the last time he ever see any of them. At least the organization would look after his family. Hey would have to work, and with their father advancing in age, but they would survive. His plan didn't work. Hey and Y were awake, and Chun cursed his luck. The two of them looked at him up and down and saw a man preparing to leave for good, anxious and agitated. The two fired the questions right at Chun. Where are you going? When are you coming back? I asked. I don't know, Chun said. Why do you need to go? I asked. So they won't hurt you if things go bad, Chun said. This is my responsibility. I can't bring you into it. The two were tearing up and was breaking. Hey managed to stammer out some final words, but what do we do? How will we survive? Chun placed the secure hand on the young man's shoulders. Look, hey, you're old enough to be a man of the house. It's all in your hands. Both of you look after our parents. Don't get in trouble. Bravery's reward. Home. Check the water pressure. If the water canning isn't up and running, we're screwed. Captain Kikuchi yelled to a subordinate. Hung sheepishly peeked his head through the roof of the water truck. He squeezed the trigger and a powerful gush of water came out of the can and mounted atop the vehicle. It's good to go, boss. Hong's hands were still trembling from his brief foray from the, away from the safety of the riot vehicles. And the vehicle that sat, Lam, Hong, and the Japanese captain. The rest of the department was down in the thick of it, defending the barricades. The truck and water cannon was a linchpin of their defenses. I can't believe you guys, it's like you've never stepped foot on a battlefield. I'm marching to Singapore for God's sakes, it's nothing compared to that rebellion we dealt with there. The captain in true IGA fashion, the lambasted Honk Hong for his cowardice while also espousing his accomplishments. Lamb said, yeah, another islander who thought of his medals and experience could crawl into rebellion of giving up bullets and bodies. The truth was. The truth was. And all the time Lamb has been on the force, he never seen rise with such vitality. In any other part of the sphere, it could have been put down easily, but not in the corporate state. He would learn soon enough. Captain Kikuchi was fuming now, as a van shook from all the debris, being thrown in the direction. Savages, he muttered to himself as he peeked his head out through the roof and manned the water cannon. Five seconds later, after unleashing it towards the crowd, Captain Kikuchi was breathing on the floor on the vehicle, blood spurting from his head and soaking his salt and pepper red hair. Lamb held down the convulsing body of the captain's long wrapped gauze around his head. Procedures no match for a ride or the brick. Bricks can hurt. Just like the negative growth. Director's on pest control. Tsushita wipes the sweat off his brow. It was only mildly warm today. <clears throat> um, uh, yet the air conditioner in his office was, uh, was all broken. He wondered if complaining about its unreliability was treason now. Perhaps he should ask a man on the other side of the line if his blank check extended purchasing equipment appliances. No, he wouldn't listen. Chief Executive Kamai was busy laying out his vision for how these rides would be dealt with. These pests must be restrained from Kamai's penthouse office. He looked down at Guangdong, saw our need for a correction. Otherwise, the infestation will spread it freely and will be unable to control them. The statue has given you the men and tools you need to lock down the streets and cordon off riders from each other. Utilize them efficiently, efficiently uh, Commissioner. Despite the chaos in the streets, despite the stress burning the state and the agents, Kamai is still polite and detached. He isn't even smiling, Sushita. I'm giving you one more chance to make this problem disappear. Please don't let me down. The line went dead. Sushita collapsed into a seat, rubbing his temples. He gave himself 30 seconds rest. Then he picked up his phone again. He called assistant commissioners below him. They called superintendents below them. In all an hour, Guangdong's police force had their orders and they marched into the streets with batons, shields, and riot control weapons. Pest control approaches an infestation. But not a mile. Okay, how much frustration does Japan have with us? 2%. That's not much. Among the security forces, of all the people we have heard degenerate rumblings of sympathy for the legitimate concerns of the riding traitors in the streets of Guangdong. Self-evidently, this prospect cannot be tolerated unless the police join hands with the protesters and rise up to topple their batters in some kind of asinine, shameless, velvet revolution. 
To counteract this horrific, uh, horrific possibility, our esteemed chief executive will direct the security forces, especially the Guangdong police, to take a hard line. Effective immediately, all security forces in Guangdong will be prohibited from engaging in any form of coordination or cooperation with the protesters. By the government's orders, they will be treated as rioters without exception unless they grow confident on perceiving a seemingly feeble police force. You know what, school? We'll, we'll just do this a few times too. It's fine. <coughs> Joys of resistance. Tsing Yang. A Tsing Yin led the crowd in song, chanting out stirring verses of unity and sonorous polemics. Her vo melodic voice could be heard throughout the street, and the voice of her fellow protesters followed. Some were braver, she heard one protest chant, Chiang Jin, Chiang Jin, yet no matter the words of their tune, so long as it was sung, it united the people. Thousands marched along the Tian He River. Uh, oh boy. Um, carrying placards, beating drums, and calling for change and justice, and anything else that Kumai and his ilk had taken from them. When she did not sing, saying reflected on the moment before this, she was a menial worker in a Hitachi factory, her life snuffed out by Guangdong each day. She walked to and fro from work as a corpse. She lost her job in the oil crisis, and only by the grace of the CCO did she survive. Now she could repay them. For the first day, she was organizing protests, writing chants for the people to call out against these tyrants. It was here amongst friends and countrymen that she reclaimed her voice and rekindled her life. They marched as free people in charge of their destiny. They felt that nothing could stop this wave, it would crash into Kamai's slugs like a mighty tsunami and drown all the hatred and fear in their lives. Saying so started leading them to another champ, but chaos from the front drowned out her calm response. She took her head out and joined the rest of the crowd in freezing. Black suit arrived, cause bearing. Clear shields emerged from the side streets and tight columns, penning the protesters in. They were surrounded, yet the crowd's drums would be beat in defiance. The police watched them for a moment behind them, someone made a call to advance, batons aloft, the police closed in, a black wave lurching towards the protest, and in a few minutes, Tsang's life would be snuffed out again and forever. Have we reached the end? Yamao Chihiro, she fastened his coat around his chest. A chill wind fell on Guangdong. The overcast sky is shaded deep gray by smoke from the fires of the rebellion, of course. <laughs> he walked the empty streets, attempting to clear his head where the city was not touched by the riots. In the distance, he heard a cry echoing through the streets. Yamao did not understand what they said, but he could draw a clear message from the panicked screams and sirens that followed. He passes by a scowling man in a green shirt. Yamao shows him his papers, just like the last three camp officers he encountered, and he hears again that these streets are dangerous to walk through. Trucks pass by, too, carrying dozens of camp officers approaching resistance. Yamauchi turned the corner. So another thick column of smoke rise behind an apartment complex. He could not see it, but he knew what was behind it. One more factory, this one owned by a passing Zushin acquaintance. The smoke trailed upwards, adding to the dark haze above him at the side he could only sigh. It's factories, buildings, business. They'll all be on fire soon, once his rebellion hits this corner of Hong Kong. Ever since most of his workforce stopped showing up for his shifts, he much knew Nintendo would not survive the riots. All he was doing now was buying himself and the few employees who stuck by him sometimes, selling off old stock. Soon they'd be down to the last hand food at deck, and then it would be time to sell the manufacturing equipment. It would all be disassembled and shipped to the home aisles, and Yamauchi would be stuck with the shipping and handling fees, and if it was also there, of course. Hands in his pockets, Yamauchi turned around and walked back to his last warehouse to oversee the fire sale. His head was full of dreams and ideas that he could never fulfill. Now, not now. And under Hitachi's leadership, never here. If he succeeded, he could, we could have rose to the heavens. Dependence only. The Kawashima family tried to distract little Haruko with their favorite little Don and picture book as a car weave towards Koshu Airport. Oh, I've read this before. If you want to read this one, please go ahead. Oh, God. It's 11%. We'll do it for now, but because this will decrease government frustration, so. Now I'll be able to take action against them. Ooh, I don't know about that. Radicalism is very high. Strength is pretty pretty high, too. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. We get 40 political power. That's not bad. Not a mile. Cordon off the streets. The ungrateful protesting horde of rabble rousers, foreign agents, and communists are choking the streets of Koshu and a myriad of other cities. If we let them run wild, affording them undeserved freedom of movement, countless important buildings will be overrun before we can say, Turn no haika banzai. Just why would they. Just why that would prove devastating is self evident. As this prospect cannot be borne, let us make our job easier, then we prepare to take them down head on. We must set up cordons in the major areas affected by these degenerate ingrates so as to make sure that we, do, that we and not they, determine where they do or do not go. Having contained them in this fashion, we'll be well placed at closing on them hard and fast in the future. We need a lot of political power. Jesus. <laughs> Pack them in. Our directive of ordering the police and the security forces to seal themselves off emotionally from the traitors rabble the streets have taken fruit, and now they're fully ready to do our bidding as, a right, as it is right and proper. In fact, the commissioner and other prominent officers have now approached us asking for advice on how to best deal with the rioters. Let's put the police to use by coordinating with them to certain circle. They already cordoned off groups of protesters. We'll entrap them in the ghettos and the poorer districts and prevent them from moving back and forth between cities. Let's see just how strong their will is when they find themselves herded back and forth like so many livestock at a whim. Discreet inquiries. Um... I think I read this one before, too. What are the Chinese up to? 
So if that's the case, we actually be really surplus. We have economy shrinking, but we still have a surplus, which is you know relatively decent. Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Hope Vietnam gets a focus tree. They sound like a very fun uh, group to play as, but you know whatever. Happy 1972, everybody. An economic check would probably be a really bad thing for us right now, as the game is lagging super hard when we want to save for some reason. Very weird, but whatever. Yeah, I don't want to do any of these things. But where is it? We're taking a lot of things here. Product cycle. Oh yeah, product cycle is probably coming up too. God dang it. Got a little higher than normal, huh? Interesting. Product cycle. Investigate console in general. So I'll click on that. I probably won't read most of them just because I've read most of them before. So. Losing grip. Attacks are relentless. Riders are numerous. Use can't buy tie. Okay, try to dismantle them. It's not going to go well for the first time. I can guarantee you. All the king's men. If you want to do this, please go ahead. Hey, advancement of power, efficiency, technology. Nice. Japan actually is not that frustrated with us, which is pretty good overall. You know what? Actually, we might take that then. Increase Japanese frustration by five. I'm okay with that then. I'm okay with it then. Divert resources away. Eh, we could if we have to. For your eyes only, if you're wondering about this, please go right ahead. Links. Well, we can do Song and Wang. Let's do that one. Good cop, bad cop. 33 years old, a lower management position with a medium sized corporation, single member of the corporate. Uh, oh, I think I read this one before. Um, yeah, I've read this one definitely before, so. You're going to need them, please. Go right ahead. Hmm. I don't know. Is this the same every single time? I don't know. If, if things don't go well, I'm just going to just do things the way I want to do, so. Oh, check them out. Cornering them off, packing them in, splitting them up. We have made great progress in the fight against the communists and the foreign agents in the streets of Guangdong, but more can be done. We notice a large proportion of these traders manage to keep themselves afloat by relying on local businesses. With or without the consent. Furthermore, in a violation of common sense, they are still able to call in emergency services when they are wounded. But then that makes sense. Since a great chief executive. Once the other two too busy, and tell them to focus on people that actually deserve help. No more. Our esteemed chief executive now gets a new directive. Let everything be shut down. Close businesses by hook or by crook. Block emergency services from working in areas where the riots are at the worst. Any potential loss of life from legitimate law-abiding citizens suddenly cut off is more than worth the benefit to the public of seeing the renegade agitators keep down and out without medical help. Finally, let everyone seen escaping the lawless crowds be arrested. This will thin their numbers and force them to give in eventually. Marching orders. It's precisely 9 a.m. that morning. Phone calls went off from Guangdong Central Security Offices to police stations all across the country's urban areas. The pigeons took flight carrying the demands of the chief executive and were promptly read out to all riot enforcement personnel. The chief executive insisted upon an overall strategy to divide and conquer. Different groups of protesters in the cities could not be allowed to unite with each other, thus they overwhelmed the government's defenses through sheer, sheer numbers. To that end, police were to rob off cities into zones. The message ends with a uh, note of dire warning. Should you fail, the chief executive warned, the protesters were overthrown the Guangdong government, reducing southern China to a roiling pot of chaos and hatred. Whatever the inner thoughts of the police officers, they had duly set about their task. By the time of the day was out, Zones have been established across most urban areas. Police patrol the streets in armored vehicles, shouting at civilians to remain indoors after curfew or suffer the consequences. Oh, these titans. From suspects. Are you going to do this? Please go ahead. Nice. Second carrot. Call the department find an enhanced investigator. Oh, we're going to do this one. Dossier song. Why was he returned to Guangdong in 62? Is there any crisis? That's not good. Um, Guangdong Blues. Uh, yeah, interesting. Hideaway. Ma Chiu Yu. Look, not twice at the door in the dilapidated apartment complex. Oh, I've read this one before. There will be more of us. You want to do this? Please go ahead. Not good, not good. Risky investments. Kamai strided down the hallway, taking a sharp turn right to enter a small conference room. The room was windowless and lit by two overhead lights, and was furnished by a single conference table. At the far end of the, uh, sat the director of Mangyo, Sajima. Nissan and Mangyo were worried about the escalating extent of the riots, and had sent him as a representative to clarify the situation. The offer of more investment in the situation was a looming but undesirable prospect, as always. Kamai bowed politely and sat down. You understand why I'm here, Kamai? Sajima. Sajima asked. The situation is not developing favorably at all. We need to guarantee that things can be left in control. Of course, Kumai said, nodding. It annoyed him that someone had a gun over his head, but he would not rise to it. I have everything under control. I only need more time. 
The conversation continued without much disagreement or error. Sajimo was happy to hear that everything was under control and kept to Komai's analysis. Komai's preference was to deal with the situation with what they had already been provided and not request anything more. And this was more than agreeable from the perspective of Nissan Mangyo after all. What was all that money invested for in the first place? So it's agreed there's no need for any more material support. Pitching plague, huh? If you're going to do this, please go ahead. Cracking the facade. Investigate the intense connections. How's that one? It meant to Typhoon. <coughs> oh, familiar stomping ground. Here's this one. You're going to do this one. The only made it almost impossible to concentrate. Protests are screaming slogans, police shouting orders, there was a cacophony, a wall of sound that threatened to break your concentration. And this was something that you could ill afford as you tried to find a way through the crowds. As she got closer and closer to the apartment, however, things began to look up. Slowly, the noise became more distant, the air became more calm, and she'd hoped that she could just go to her apartment and grab her things and return to the office, where all of her colleagues from the Kantan Fuji and Koran were staying for safety. There was just one issue, as a can't put the officer to prevent her from crossing the street. It is an impossible problem, Yoshiko thought, because at least we're both Japanese. Before the soldier could open his mouth, she spoke first, putting all the charm she could, speaking in perfect Japanese. Excuse me, officer. I need to get through, by apartments on the other side, as she said. I'm sorry if I can't let you do that, he replied. The Guangdong government has cleared this area of the safe zone. Only authorized personnel are allowed to cross. This is to protect the lives and property of the people of Guangdong. Yoshiko tisked under her breath. She had come a long way. She wasn't going keen on giving up now, especially since she was so close, so, officer. My belongings are across the street, and I don't know what will happen to them. The after's face remained locked in stone, his voice unyielding. Well, Mr. your life is more important than your property. The district you are attempting to cross into is dangerous for us, let alone a civilian like yourself. There was no choice, then. What was already a difficult situation becomes significantly worse if you try to challenge a camp by time. She turned away, trying to figure out what to do next. But it was increasingly clear that Guangdong wasn't safe anymore for anybody. What do you do during the war? Choke them out. Metal grind, stomachs churn. For all attempts at making these protesting ingrates and good for to understand the reality of the situation, the riots, far from improving, have in fact worsened. Though we have had minor successes in courting them off the streets, packing them in, and choking them out, the rival has merely grown more intense, and public order is an all-time low. Needless to say, the situation cannot be less desirable. Our esteemed chief executive must show these people their place, or he will fall more dramatically than the Yasuda sucks and then their employees did last decade. Kamaki and Ichiro must act swiftly to prevent this. He now has two choices in front of him. Using either harsh general measures or precise, calculated strikes. The flame grows ever fiercer, so do our countermeasures. Evaluation. Maybe run this place good at two. Interesting. So it's choice specimens. Swift action is of the utmost importance. This action will be less efficient because of the radicals in the buff 50%. So. Let's see Blast from the past. Trouble or elevations. Troubling re re revelations. Not, well, it's better than it was before. We still have a surplus, barely, though. And... Follow the glass, we get the Zidanas off the streets. Follow the Zidana cocktail trial. Hmm. Let me do that one. From Foreign Shore is interesting. Uh, oil and flame. Tigers, bears, and tundras. There's this one. Economic review. They're all burned together. 57 billion. Even people who lie to cover for each other's actions, the commonalities between suspects can speak louder than any alibi. The came to the Zidana, someone has had to own or work in a large space large enough to store them in bulk. Someone had to bought the bottles and the gasoline. Someone had to collect them and distribute them in turn. Armed with a clear line of questioning, the gaps in the stories filled themselves. Several men had business. At a dis disused warehouse in the Koshu dockyards. Cursory inspection of the ownership records revealed that the said business was far from innocuous. This is under a shell company known to be linked with the GFT. Going well, back over the transcripts from the GFT's lieutenant in interrogation. The lieutenant had been in the warehouse general vicinity several times over the past two weeks. I was enough to assume that the location could be more important than a simple supply center, but assumptions meant little without proof. A possible lead? Perhaps. 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 Street battle. The thin blue lines of police officers looking insignificant against a boiling mass of humanity facing them, and they certainly felt insignificant. Each officer held a truncheon, and the riot showed in a white knuckle grip, swept dropping down the backs of their necks. The officer bellowed the orders to advance, barely able to hear her over the din, and the officers looked, locked shields and marched. The events set off panic in the crowd. A chorus of screams and wails pierced the air as protesters were trampled or straight too close to advancing lines. Hundreds poured into the surrounding streets and alleyways, causing more serious injuries than the stampede. The officers were just beginning to relax a little when a brick sailed over the crowd and struck one of the officers clean on the head, sending him screaming to the ground. Suddenly, the trenches were swinging and the police were roaring and the crowd was roaring. The air was dark with flying bricks, debris, shoots, anything the protesters could get their hands on. 
Someone got a hold of the fireworks and pop popping off their little street artillery mixed with the cries of the wounded and the noise of the warriors to get an infernal barrage that could be heard just across the entire city. Well, I got you paralyzed. Do as I say. Third or fourth is useless without promise of reprieve. A sound strategy, even if it will anger the most bloodthirsty among us. Not as I do. As well passed down, we tell the riders meaning of unrestricted violence. Ooh. So we have two options here. Oh, this is fun. Beautiful nation. Um, though our methods seem extreme, our intent will be understood by those who matter. Hmm. Despite all its toils. Increase liquor reserves by 0.8 billion. Wow. Our troubles are temporary, our potential is infinite. Decrease Japanese frustration by 10%. We'll survive. That's not bad. I think I want to do the left side here. House always wins. The game was rigged from the start. Of course it was. Criminals don't figure it out until it's too late. I play this game the best. So, this. I play the game the best. Sounds like it is for the uh, other route, the personalist route for uh, Komai Kenichiro. So, I'm going to go with Do As I Say. <coughs> Wipe the streets, huh? That sounds like fun. No negotiations, huh? If criminals don't want to live in Guangdong, we're happy to oblige. Our chief executive, Kumai Kinichiro, knows that he's the head of the city of Guangdong, the sole guarantee of the beauty and prosperity. Accordingly, he has long concluded that he cannot settle for half measures, so called precision strikes. No, a headstrong approach must be in the words of the day. We have no other choice in the matter. The chief executive will now go about on national television and outline himself as the rightful leader of the nation. He will describe himself as the guide of the trouble Guangdong populace while urging the protesters to back down. Kumai Kinichiro will not rest until all Guangdong understands the following fact of life. Our chief executive is Guangdong strongman. As authority of the Delta, this delta is not to be questioned by anyone, let alone uh, commoners who rightfully ordain place in life is to do and die rather than question why. The case. A web unravels. There you go. Transcript. A suspect. Bingo. Uh, there you go. Well... Uh, Searching military archives in Nanjing found nothing. No record of Sun Guang, Sun Ziguang exists in the ranks of the RGOC. Evident that he had bought on the losing side. The question now whether he was a communist or a nationalist. Records from the Japan, Japanese observers in the romp Soviet Union before the West Russian War co coincided with Song's tenure. A political officer in the Chinese diplomatic mission, one with a degree of familiarity with the communists that unnerved the observers, but had left a favorable impression on the Russians. Police reports from Song's suspected contacts, meanwhile, broke down into two groups. Older men of Song's age and younger folks refused all but the basic information when interrogated, and an inspection of their homes had revealed a county copy of a socialist literature, Mal, Marx, Engels. A single arm bound was recovered from the homes of the older suspects. Blood red, with N4A, proudly emblazoned on the side. Bingo! And a transcript. Just give him his darn concessions, huh? Uh, what is this? Stanley, Hose, Antiques, and uh, Curious. Ask uh, so again, we know the subject is linked to the Zions and his warehouse. We know that your shop uses the warehouse to store inventory. You, what did you see? Give it a rest already. I was only there for my own business. This place is a cavern. Have you been there? I haven't seen wherever the subject was or any Zidans or. Those Zidans burned down one of the wet markets the other day. Somebody's got carelessly handling their batch, and now an entire neighborhood's going to go hungry. But the politics aside, do you really want to see more people suffer because of the actions of hotheads with deadly weapons? Fire doesn't discriminate. Your shop will be safer for it, I guarantee you. I'm still in handcuffs here, aren't I? Unless you've got a hand I guarantee that I leave the station free man, I'm not telling you crap. Oh, we'll see. Dossier. The dossier put together by the GPF, the Manila folder sitting idly on the desk of the chief executives, it was explosive, to put it mildly. The ex uh, Chinese Consul General Zhang Ziguang, suspected communist, an ex member of the CCP's fourth new army, new fourth army, possibly have involved in communist anti sphere activities throughout his diplomatic career. Suspicious activity in Russia, a possible intelligence asset, used his time abroad to assess the state of Japan's enemies, observe the Nanjing government, and subvert Guangdong through the support of the protest movement. Enough to have Song recalled in Nanjing and placed under investigation. The war may have been. Oh, over 20 years ago, but the RGOC remains an unfriendly place to communists, former or otherwise, a smoking gun and transit point. Suspects have been restrained. 11 more grunts and runs for the holding cells that they can fit. Having secured, sir, all 13 crates of them, they filled to the brim with Zidanums. Entry platoon all accounted for, sir. A few bruises and cuts, nothing requiring hospitalization. Captain Omur Okamura received each report with a punctuary grunt. Uh, never once before breaking his perpetual front, but failing to suppress the impatient tapping of his fingers on his crossed arms. Even as his men took stock of the captured warehouse, the uh, cleaner crews gingerly to dodge into the pl uh, pools of fuel and blood mixing the floor, he hadn't received the one report he wanted to hear. The intel, the promised intelligence that would pull the back of the curtain on Guangdong's Federation tradesmen, the smoking gun that would lead the police to their base of operations, that was all Okamura was interested in, more so than the weapons captured in the evidence seized, even more than the safety of his men. 
It was the key to his promotion, a raise, and his plane to get out of this sweltering, mosquito infested, unrestrained, unrested, stricken crap hole. And he saw his adjutant warily exit the office at the far side of the warehouse, his shoulders so lumped and his fingers smeared in ink. He knew that he had hoped in vain. There would be nothing remarkable about today's raid, and the GFT had eluded them once more. A supply hub and nothing more. Crud. Pursuing three doubts. Uh, after the last minute of the day, when the sun had long since been replaced by the twinkling fire of the Kaushu streets, Chief Executive Kamai Kenichiro thumbed through the assembled evidence against the Chinese Consul General. The plays were dog eared, the contents were already familiar to the Chief Executive, but he could not help but review them over and over again, given the scale of the decision to him. Sadly, this time would not be a luxury that Kama Kenichiro would enjoy forever. It was already half a miracle that the Chinese hadn't caught on to the police investigation already. The more time spent following up on leads concerning the activities of the Chinese government, and those of the two representatives in Guangdong, the greater the risk it would all be exposed, creating a diplomatic nightmare. And yet, going in the other direction, accusing Consul General Song Zigong and Attaché Wang Jingzhu of actively subverting Guangdong was absolutely guaranteed to cause a diplomatic incident, and there wasn't enough proof to get Japan to take Guangdong's side. Would there even be enough evidence to ensure that even? And if so, why was more... Why waste more resources on a fool's errand? Come on, can I show side and flick through the pages again? We don't have enough. I'm strong enough to be taken seriously. Act with caution. There's no point in abandoning this. Press claims of the Consul General. We know one of their pasts. We can do that one. Try it. If it doesn't go well, it doesn't go well, and I can always restart. And why not? So. On hold. Uh. Chief Executive Kumai Kenichiro's days were so occupied with crisis meetings and security briefings that it was easy to lose track of time. The ceaseless violence and dislocation of the riots seemed to warp time into an endless loop, extinguishing fires only to be seen them flare again with each dawn. When not preoccupied <coughs> with the latest emergency of the day, Kumai uh, Kenichiro's sus turned to the courier sent to Nanjing in Tokyo, and trusted the copies of Guangdong's findings on Song Ziguang and Wang Jingzhu. They had been given instruction to show its contents to nobody but the individual Kumai Kenichiro named in the highest levels of government, no matter how long it took to get a meeting as a result. Even then, it was taking longer than Komaki and had hoped, and as the days blend into nights and then into days, more pressing matters took priority. Protests, work delays, destruction, there was no shortage of bad news to be had, to the point that everything else faded to the background. Until Komaki and secretary appeared in the chief executive's office, saying that Nanjing was calling and needed to speak immediately. Test me, if you want to hear this, please go ahead. I'm losing a grasp. Oh. Well, if you don't know this one, please go ahead, too. Yeah, we failed. So it's very hopeless. Attacks are a lot less. You know, it is what it is. Happy March, though. We'll do whatever, whatever we need. A breather. Uh, that's local communities. And basically, RLC. Ah. Oh, look at this. Uh, the newspaper kids were making a killing these days. A businessman thought as he went to pick up his morning paper. Every day they had something new and important to scream about on the street corners. Today was no different. Chinese diplomats were called in on Jing, the child be bellowed right next to him as he picked up his paper, dropping a few coins into the child's box. A Japanese request immediate recall. The businessman went to their ear splitting noise and hurried away, burying his head in the paper. Uh, Consul General Song Ziguang and his attache, a man named Wang, had both been recalled to Nanjing for consultations with their home government. The Japanese had made this request based on unspecified allegations against the two, which the paper excitedly speculated and had something to do with the ongoing riots. Speaking of riots, the businessman flipped to the next page of the paper to see that the last night's disturbances had been considerably quieter than anticipated. Though there had been violent clashes with police that had left several injured, as well as extensive damage to cars and front shop fronts in the area, there had been no deaths, which was an unfortunate rarity these days. Things were going over by any means, of course. The entire country was still a boiling pot, and ready to overflow at any time, but it seemed like the government had the right idea in going after the Consul General. The government marches on. Major victory. Nice. A re -evaluation. The first hint of unease in the police commissioner Tsushima's mind for, came when his Kempata escort told him that a huge block of land in the center of the manufacturing district was a no-go zone and that they'd have to take a helicopter. The image in Tsushima's mind at this point when he thought of the protest was a few crowded streets, some placards, and an occasional bottle being thrown as they approached the manufacturing district, though Tsushima felt as if ice had started to flow through his veins. He could barely believe what he was seeing, an ocean of humanity, a tsunami thrashing mercilessly against a hopelessly outnumbered set of police cordons. One of the lieutenants on the plane directed his attention to one cordon, which was buckling inwards under the onslaught as Tsushima wanted to watch in shock. The cordon suddenly collapsed and vanished under the tide of protesters who could surge into the gap. Even over the helicopter's engines, he could hear the roars of the crowd. As the helicopter turned and banked away, Tsushima realized that the situation was a lot worse than he had been allowed to believe. Not only were there the more protesters, but they were also more violent. There would need to be a change of plan. So the government buckles under the pressure. Leave by sundown. Decreases the seats by one. Spend a lot of money. Pump up the budget. 
I like more government control. During the oil crisis, with spare cash brought about from the myriad different cuts and abstractions, and production recovering back to pre-crisis levels thanks to more cuts and the help of our honored chief executives, mainly allies and benefactors, we're able to create a significant increase in funds. Now, with the economy more or less stabilized despite the disorder of our great state, we can put these funds to use. Put more money in the policing and security and let these budgets climb. That allows us to put these renegade dudes down and ensure they continue promotion of law and order in a glorious city of Guangdong. What's not to love? Um, doing okay. <coughs> uh, let's see, there is some before. Old friends and new acquaintances. Camp Pai Public Security Division, Intelligence Section Briefing on suspected ROC involvement of the present crisis. The Republic of China has made no official declaration of support either toward our government nor insurgent groups and has stated the rise to be an internal issue for our government. However, the Chinese consulate has criticized police and Camp Pai handling of the situation as unacceptable treatment of our Chinese brothers as an obvious inflammatory statement. Uh, nonetheless, there remains scant proof of any material assistance by China to the CCL. However, the internal structure of the Chinese intelligence is better known than that of the, of the CCL, and appropriate observations have been uh, accordingly made. Despite recent organizational shakeups, the ranking intelligence officer in Guangdong is believed to be Wang Jingku of the Recursion National Security Bureau, known for previous collaboration with the Camp Pai Tai Cobra operations. In addition to several known confidants being involved in CCL activities, Wang was observed meeting with a number of unknown figures before the riots occurred. Wang has really been observed in the public uh, uh, since the beginning of the rise, including arriving and departing from the Chinese Consul General in his office official capacity as a political attaché to Consul General Song. It's possible that his network of contacts, both old and new, represent a simple observation on behalf of the Chinese government, but given the steady decline in sino Japanese relations, this seems unlikely. An immediate investigation into the actions of Wang's middlement, middlement is strongly recommended. Can't trust anybody these days, man. Can't. On and on, Spurs. Oh, do we do, do we are we relocating sources? Oh, oh, here it is. Left situation changes, on and on it spins. I would really like to think like to work for Master Shia, sir, and I believe I'll be useful to you. Please give me the job with your esteemed company. Hi, hey, great to see you. He bowed, trying his best not to show any discomfort. The foreman clapped his hands, smiling and usually cheery. Hey, remain unpre unimpressed, unflinching, and preparing for the worst. Marvelous, marvelous. No, nice to meet you. I'm uh, Teruchi. I'm glad you understand what a privilege it is to work here. I've done so much for employees. We've done so much. We kept the dorms safe. We even offered to bring their families in with them, and most of them just walked out of the door the moment the riots began. Ungrateful brats. Foreman. Teruchi. Stop for a moment, sensing Hay's lack of enthusiasm. I'm sorry for you running so much, he said. So I'll cut to the chase. Can you start immediately? Yes, of course, Hay replied. Before he was done, the foreman was already making, shaking, his head, shaking his hand firmly. That's good, he said. I'll get the forms. He scampered off, leaving Hay alone with time to think. This was decent as far as Masashita went, and the foreman seemed amiable enough. Perhaps it could even be bearable soon enough to you return with the forms and a few caveats. Two more things. First, we don't need you to work evenings. We're running at half power, so we need all the manpower we can get. Secondly, do you want to move into the dorms? The streets are dangerous. Too good to be true, after all. Even during the riots, it would be drudgery and long hours with mediocre pay. He steeled himself, thought to have his family said, No, I think I'll manage. Almost, literally almost three a day, the go-betweens. Stand of conduct. Yeah, if you remember this one, please go ahead. Efficiency and monotony. <coughs> the go-betweens. The Camp Pai Tai, uh, Public Security Division, uh, both the long-standing and recent assets, uh, affiliates and confidence of Wang Jingku, uh, Jingku, and thus the Na Chinese National Security Bureau follow a general pattern. Generally, members of the Wang Network are figures of modest respect within their local Chinese communities or those of uh, uh, holding minor positions of authority. Teachers and factory foremen are the two most common professions among the circle, which is believed to be an attempt. Uh, infiltrate CCL leadership or direct their tactics. As many of us sent into suspended or suspected command positions, this appears to be successful. Figures connected to organized crime are also present within the circle who may be conducting acts of violence at the behest of the Chinese state. While these contacts were utilized in previous Camp Pai ROC intelligence joint operations against labor militancy, this apparently not prevented their harmonious collaboration within the CCL. Close monitoring of the residents and communications of uh, relevant Figures suggested a significant influx in both financial and material resources, which are subsequently in funnel to suspected CCL level leaders. With the present wealth of knowledge and information available to us, both Camp Pai Tai and GFP leaders believe it is within our grasp to remove a sizable portion of the middle rungs of the CCL command, which we would take some time to recover from. This, however, uh, was likely only grants a portion of the information required to effectively identify and neutralize CCL leadership. But perhaps more so significantly for the long term, however, we have yet to establish a direct flow of resources between the surgeons and the ROC intelligence, which may pose an uncalculable threat to our national security even after the final suppression of the riots. Take out the middlemen, or there's no long term. Attack in a handbasket. 
Normally hosts many visitors and staff members. Kumai's office sat seemingly quiet and vacant. The door was shut and locked, and the blinds were pulled on over the windows. No light could be seen from under the door between the blinds. Despite all this, the office was very much occupied, and it was currently the scene of a heated argument. Kumai sat upright in his chair, holding a telephone to his ear. He spoke into it firmly, but tried to avoid raising his voice. I promise you, Director Samijima, there's no need to investigate the matter. The King may have my guarantee that I can handle the situation here. I do not need help. We've been here before, Kamai. I cannot rely on phone updates anymore. Things seem bad. We'll be investigating the situation, Sajima said forcefully. Kamai sighed and tried once more. I really would have insisted that you rely only on my telephone updates. I really have things under control. I can give you a clear picture. Kamai had barely gotten these words from his mouth when the reply came in. Kamai, us authorities is in is investigating the matter itself. That is the end of it. The line dropped. Kamai buried his face in his hands and sighed. So King would learn, so, so, learn quickly how bad things really were. So when Kamai reached for the phone, he needed to make a few calls, at least to the IJA and the Kampai Tai. Another nail in the coffin. Great. How great. Alright, what are we going to do here? More government control? Oh, God knows we're going to need it. Non lethal rounds. Good stuff. Good stuff. God dang it. Status report. The room was full of tired faces, grim and tired faces, even here in a Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen's shop. Probably the safest for them to be in the country, and we're still looking over the, the shore as if a Hitachi boogeyman was going to jump at them from around the corner. The fighters share what food they had as representatives from each cell got up to make the reports. The victories were celebrated and the casualties more, and the man got down to the discussing strategy. According to the couple of cells, the police were finally starting to fire back at them in earnest. Chun personally hadn't really seen the police do anything except run, and they were still by far the easiest of the security forces to deal with. Attaching the camp by tower was always trigger happy in the extreme. <coughs> Disappearances were common. Trigger gas was used so often that entire districts would make your eyes water if you walked through them. The braver among the government forces were even making nightly incursions in resistance territory, armed with plentiful rubber rounds and the ever present tear gas. The only chance anyone got up to rest uh, or got to rest up was when they met with their Zhujin comrades in the GFT. When they rotated off the street patrols, they had acted as runners for the replacements. With well, optimistic cheers and songs, the meeting broke up and John left to get back to work. The fight goes on. What is this? Hmm. Decrease the growth or decrease? Oh. Honestly, we don't need to do this one yet. Frustration is a 20%, which is pretty bad, but still. Ooh, I don't want to do this one. I do not want to decrease government control. Strength, radicalism, and despair. You really gotta read all these before you make any big old decision. What's this one? Yeah, no. No, we're good. We are good. Resolve. Come on, I didn't know how many hours he had been awake by this point. It a raging migraine, and his hands were starting to shake slightly, but after an entire night of strategizing and discussion, he finally suddenly had resembled a plan. We just can't keep saying the police running into them, he said to the conference room. As was raw and hoarse when they continuous talking, it would only escalate the situation, and eventually the native elements in the force will crack. No, we'll have to be smart and respond asymmetrically. The strength is in their numbers, their weakness is in discipline. We'll not confront them where they can bring their numbers to bear. We'll start them out. Keep the cordons up, keep the camp by tie to pick off any leadership that might form. If we keep a shapeless mass, then our threat will disintegrate. I agree entirely with the said Commissioner Tsushido. Sitting in a darkened room in the corner, darkened corner of the room, I'll send orders to the place and get a meeting with the Kampai Tai. While well, these traders disperse, the response takes shape, so no need to panic, my friends. No need to panic at all. Any sitter that wishes to survive for more than two or three hours must prioritize the welfare of those who contribute to the most of it, rewarding only the good and loyal servants. And in these latter days, since the fall of Yasuda and Yasuzuki, who have been more loyal to the glorious, beautiful city of Guangdong and their prosperity than the corporations with Nissan, Mangyo, and Hitachi at their head, who has contributed more to this great nation than them? The rioting ingrates outside do not understand that the corporations of Guangdong are above them for their benefit, as well as ours. Out of a foolish desire for equality, they are now beginning to threaten the company's assets. That's going to be tolerated accordingly. Well, some will promise to assure the safety and private of private corporate holdings in Guangdong with Hitachi and Nissan among you prioritized. That's a simple, friendly conversation. The arrest and subsequent interrogation of 17 individuals suspected to be connected to Chinese intelligence has yielded only minor results. Extensive cross-referencing and follow-up raids and interviews of the apprehended figures, all of whom admit CCL or tried involvement, has generated some actionable intelligence on the CCL leadership figures, however, at present this is insufficient to deliver a ir irrecoverable blow to military command. Uh, a solid link between the apprehended figures and the Chinese National Security Bureau is yet to be established. All arrested figures are either native to Guangdong or possess legitimate Guangdong citizen do citizenship documents. Although the latter is unusual for Guangdong's settled migrant population, many have admitted to meeting with uh, Wang Jingku directly, though never more than seen in his official position as political attaché of the Consul General. As all presently available evidence towards the Republic of China's culpability is circumstantial, we we'll remain in no position to demand evidence nor accountability from Nanjing. Has thus recommended to conduct a more thorough investigation into China's espionage within Guangdong in future. Although it's likely the recent arrest will not go ignored by the National Security Bureau. At present, however, a different angle of investigation is necessary to uncover the identities of CCL leaders. Back to the drawing board. 
We'll receive one of the required clues needed before we can strike the CCL. Now the government, government controls the underworld, we'll need two clues. We're gonna fail, but it's just, uh, we did okay. Japanese frustration is still pretty high, so I don't want to do that too much. Yeah, don't want that one either. Tense meeting. Hey, everybody, this one, please go ahead. Hope we don't fail. Five is good enough. Leader case. Pop up the budget. Leave by sundown, according to Liam Loff, packing them in, splitting them up, choking them up by depriving them of access to business and healthcare. We made great progress in the fight against communists and foreign agents in the streets of Guangdong, but more can be done to bring an end to this nonsense. The riders will now be issued daily warnings. They must clear up by sundown each night in order to assure peace and good order in the city streets. Otherwise, the police will be directed to use harsh force to arrest and jail them without mercy or consideration. We have to go on good duty, uh, on good authority that they will be fully ready, willing, and able to see this done. Taking the streets. Hmm. I read this one before, so you're gonna split your head. Wait for a hierarchy to emerge. Our routine disrupted. Oh, maybe one of this one please go ahead too. God dang it. How are we looking? Not worse, worse. Singling out the big fish. While the waiting game is far from being an ideal solution to a crisis such as this, the tight alien organization the CCL proves that there is a command hierarchy pulling all the strings. Such a hierarchy will doubtlessly show once it's amongst, itself among the prisoners, so the creative use of a spacious room serves as a holding cell, a one-way window for observing officers, and a coffee machine to maintain astute vigilance. The authorities stand by and watch for the first sign of leadership among the detained. With some time, the patients will be rewarded. Eventually, the prisoners begin to crack and seek out their authority figures for guidance. One among them seems to stand out the most, Liu Xing, an ex-captain of the KMT, a veteran of the number of battles against the Imperial Army, and also manager of the Yellow Dragon Association, which lends aid to the migrating Chinese. With the ringleader angled out, all that's left now is to send the rabble back to their cells and begin the interrogations thoroughly, first with Captain Singh. Let's proceed. The future stake. Are you going to this? Please go ahead. Maybe we'll go on to that one. There we go. I don't spend too much with the because we don't really need to. We do whatever we need to to increase government control and increase Japanese frustration, though. Smooth sailing. The banquet room was a majestic example of Lake Victorian architecture. Constructed by the British in the closing decades of their dominance over East Asia. Or the Far East, I should say. The exu building exuded a luxury and hubris among every nook and cranny beneath golden chandeliers, Komaki and Shiro feasted of the most powerful executives of Guangdong. As the last course was cleared away, Kumai stood up at the head table. All eyes swiveled his way immediately, and like a switch had been flicked, the room fell into silence. Gentlemen, he began, you know full well that we have difficulties as of late with restraining the native population. Certain disaffected elements of the population have been rallied together under the aegis of a group of hardline professional revolutionaries. It is true that these riots have put our police force under stress, but rest assured that these recent upsets pose no serious threat to your investments in this country. We will not abandon our great experiment here to a howling mob, that's my promise to you. A run of polite applause was ensued, and Kumai sat back down, trying fervently to believe in what he was saying. A necessary charade, and locked down the streets. We made great progress in the fight against the communists and the foreign agents in the streets of Guangdong, most recently by ordering rioters to leave by sundown. But we can do more yet to make sure that the renegades that dare question our great chief executive Kumai's authority learn the place as quickly as possible. We bore them to leave the streets every sundown, and circle them in ghettos and poor areas. Now we are at last poised to strike. Let us take this opportunity before the situation changes. Let the uh, groups of rioters we have encircled be circled down and dealt with as soon as humanly possible. You want to do this, please, good head? Nice. One step ahead. If you're so too, please go ahead. Uh, let us keep quiet. We could probably do this one post X security. Uh, yeah, read this one, please go ahead. We'll try that one. Across the court, and that morning, Lamb's captain called a meeting to read out the new orders from the top. Uh, no exceptions, curfew was well, to be established across the country's major cities. And uh, with police able to similarly arrest anyone found in violation, of course. 
A car for you, Lamb Rockin, was the only good idea the government had come up with for some time. Angry people milling around on the streets was easy to pray for the real militants, and strength in numbers often promoted people to do reckless things they wouldn't do otherwise. But it was a tough to ask for the officers down on the streets. It required a huge amount of police manpower. All patrols had to be done in significant numbers to avoid individual officers or small groups being picked off by resistance and snipers. It meant that with the police forces already stretched thin, officers would be conducting raids nearly 24-7. And entire policemen had a much greater chance of making a terrible mistake. Lamb subconsciously. Rested his hand on his butt of the gun, grateful for all the sense of protection it provided, and steeled himself for the violence to come. Now it's time to take back the streets. Guang Dong or anarchy. Our chief executive is the sole guarantee of prosperity in this nation. He is a strong man, the protector of her beauty. His authority over his delta is not to be questioned, nor should his ability to protect this glorious, beautiful state of Guang Dong and her welfare and prosperity be held in any doubt. The general public has no doubt. Deeply concerned about the state of this nation, as well as they should be given our current struggles against traitors and renegades in our streets. But they need not worry. The Honorable Chief Executive, Komai Kinichiro, is father of the nation and promoter of her beauty. He will ensure that everything goes out and turns out well. All that he, uh, <clears throat> that the good people of Guangdong need to do is conform to the orders issued by the government. If they do this, they'll have exactly nothing to fear. Honorable to Blaze, God dang it, tipping their hand. We now have enough clues due to prior investigations in the government control of the regions of Guangdong to strategically strike the CCL. Um, I think there's one before, so if you're in this one, please go ahead. This transport hubs are safe. I think I read it before, I could be wrong. Keep strength low and spend more money for government control. Increase government control. Stage two. <laughs> mm, let's save it real quick. I've said I've read stage two. I'm pretty sure before. Um, yeah, the Republic of China. We definitely want to do that because China cannot be allowed to intervene. I like the second option, but we'll see. You know. But China's definitely meddling. Retaliation. And piranhas in a barrel. That's how the officers felt about the stupid rioters. They were paralyzed by the indecision of HQ, forced to hunker down under the unrelenting onslaught of bricks and concrete rubble. They're surrounded by the protesters, but gave it another shot, uh, a couple hours, and there'd be nothing left, le nothing of them left to finish the job. Or they'd been dragged some of the comrades out of harm's way behind the police fans. There's no medical personnel in sight, so all I could do is give a pack of cigarettes. The commanding officer was blabbling away to the idiots at HQ on his radio. Though he was screaming at full volume, barely anyone who wasn't within a few meters of him could hear the actual conversation. At last, he threw down the radio and shouted in the ears of the men on either side of him. The order was passed down the line. Advance. The front of the crowd, busy hurling obscenities at the officers, met with a nasty surprise when riot shows crunched in their faces. Several went down, bleeding, and were beaten with truncheons. As the officers marched forwards, out for blood, panic began to sweep through the crowd. Further and further, they pressed inwards. No mercy was asked for, and no one was given. A blood flowed in streams down the cobbled streets. Prisoners. Um, I think that's from before, too. The Republic of China's diplomatic staff had long grown accustomed to Guangdong's watchful eye. Staff were told to avoid loud conversations in embassies' main conference rooms, which had certainly been bugged. They even recognized the stance of the plainclothes officers, hands always on their belt as they rode the subway. They even learned to disassemble knickknacks to look for hidden cameras. All these antics were passive, however. They were subtle, calculated, but all of it was changing now. As the riots grew worse, the Chinese consulate general became aware of the darker and more dangerous tactics. The planes closed officers no longer kept themselves to the subways, but stood menacingly outside the embassy compound. Staff found themselves unable to leave their homes and shoved violently back inside when they tried to leave. Telephone lines were cut, letters torn apart and discarded. Formal complaints about dwindling food and the growing piles of waste were dismissed with small token gestures. Still moldy bread ripped apart garbage bags. The world, which had once been expensive and overwhelming, shrunk to the size of a pinprick. The consul general watched all these things with growing alarm. It was clear that the chief executive was no longer satisfied to play the observer, but would instead seek to have the government of China isolated and eliminated. You would need to get in touch with Nanjing. If you don't act quickly, the situation might grow much worse. It might still even grow violent. The Chinese consul general squirms under mounting pressure. We know what you know. <coughs> right, the police can trust their own. How foolish they are. Names, 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 names. Um, let's see this one. It's written that the spy operations and targets should be pursued with respect to two kinds of people. Traitors and, right and unrighteous. 
The rioting ingrates outside despite their best efforts stood not understand that the corporations of Guangdong are above them for their benefit as well as ours as a, are a quintessential example of the kind of person that falls in both the above categories. Accordingly, we, as we send in the police and security troops to do away with the rioters from without, we we'll send informants, spies, and agitators to infiltrate the ranks, damaging for them from within. The duty will be twofold. First, they will leak any and all useful information they find at the government, and second, they'll undermine any plans the protesters may come up with. Oh, wait. The midday sun shone in the room as Kumai sat at his desk. His blinds were undrawn, and the office was opening and inviting, though Kumai was not as relaxed as his surroundings. It was anxiously awaiting the news from his staffers, who mercilessly arrived soon with a knock on the door. Kumai called for them to enter and take a seat. Mr. Kumai, among those delegation will be here soon. I understand that Director Saimijama is heading in. Kumai nodded. Any of my instructions are in place? I mean, all of, all of them. Kumai glanced around briefly and motioned for the door to be closed, including the ones for the INJ and the Camp Atai, he said in a hushed voice. The reply was short and simple affirmation, and the meeting quickly ended. All this, as the staffers dispersed in the hallway, a small group of them slinked away, determined to make a cell or make a call to Director Semijama himself. A conspiracy is afoot. I don't mind decreasing uh, Japanese frustration, at least. Stage 2. Why well, we do this? Please go ahead. Great Wall, Guangdong. <laughs> Hold the line, Captain Yard is uh, above all the commotion on the street. Lam knew about this man. A human wave was about to crash under the police lines. Lam and the other officers held fast, but all cohesion melted away moments later. He was no longer concerned about if he was fighting on the right side, nor did he stick to his plan of going easy on the protesters. Lam Hao Soon was lost in the blur of baton, bashing heavy breathing through his uh, gas mask. I'm going to do both these two. As the heat of the battle cooled down, uh, Lam regained his bearings. He was cut off from his unit in an alley. Surrounding him were protesters in various states of injury. Some were already on the run, sporting minor bruises. Others were worse off, nursing broken bones and arms, howling in English. Above all the screaming, Lam could hear the sound of his heart racing. Moments later, the cavalry arrived in form of a police van, ready to whisk away the protesters. Still dazed, Lam hitched a ride to the station. The entire ride, he tried his best to recollect the battle while also putting effort into forgetting something else. One protester that wasn't moving. Caught in the trap. Come on, Sam pensively in his office, gritting his teeth. The past few days have been tough on him. He was normally always self assured, but the situation did not seem to be developing favorably. He found himself constantly dr grinding his teeth. More than ever, he wanted to assert his control of the situation over those he commanded. As his mind began to wander away with anxiety, and knock woke him from his daydream as the secretary entered. Mr. Komai sir, the Mongyo delegation is approaching Kyushu. Everything's in place, she said. Good, thank you, uh, Komai replied, recovering quickly from his absent mind. Where might they be landing? I trust the preparations were completed, Komai asked. The question was met with a brief silence. Komai sat up, staring intently at her. She was noticeably nervous. From what I understand, sir, they're landing at Koshu Airport. There's a Camp Atai delegation to protect them at present, uh, she said, wincing. She was met immediately with a response as Kumai stood up, knocking off a glass off the table with shattered. Are you morons capable of listening to basic instruction? Why am I the only incompetent one here? Um, uh, the only one capable of understanding the situation. They're supposed to arrive at a military airfield away from the city. He marched towards the door, knocking her aside. If nobody else could manage things that he needed to insert himself to take control. As he walked out of the hallway, he found himself stopped by several executives, accompanied by the two armed Mongyo security guards. Howling at them to move, they stood impassively. Stay put, Mr. Komai. Samijama will be here shortly, one of them said. Komai stopped his protest and gazed at the scene. He found his jaw clenched tighter than ever. His fist balled up. Leaning against the door frame, he let out a sigh. He was all under control. The sting of defeat. Once now, bustling silent. Uh, the streets of Guangdong were distinctly silent compared to the usual. All protesters and pedestrians had been cleared away from the main roads, whose only traffic were the Guangdong riot police milling around. The occasional large concrete barricade imposed itself over the street, forcing people to find new routes. A curfew had been imposed across the entire city blocks, and the officers in the street were very conscious of the timid faces spying at them from the windows of buildings. In smaller side streets, people still try to gather and protest, but the possibility of the large grounds gathering was severely restricted, and those that could be found themselves easily trapped and beaten by the riot police when they went on the offensive. CCO were naturally alerted to what was happening, as they always were going to be. The from the authorities was that the organization and the leadership would be destroyed, unable to organize or resist the suppression. It's only the first step, but it soon be seen whether the operation pay off. It only gets worse from here. Broken bones and a breaking mind. Anything else about uh, increasing uh, stuff here? No. <coughs> Lamb wondered if things would ever be the same after these rides calm. Sure, the status quo has a lot to be desired, but he longed to have someone waiting for him to come home. Someone to do his laundry, cook him dinner. He wanted companionship, however, even his drab and lonesome life was better than the current state of affairs. His desires to finally find the right person had to be put on hold. Lamb Hao Xiong had, right, had to make it through this war. He was in his bathroom, desperately scrubbing the grime off his body after a day in body armor, gripping a baton. Days, Lamb recalled the events of the day. 
All the towns took a swing at a protester. The house of pain as her bones broke and their will to fight faltered. Lan felt a wide range of emotions, but most of all he felt selfish. He armed dozens so that he could come home unarmed. At the very end of every ship, there was a twinge of guilt for making it through all without a scratch, even though the suit and sweat was getting washed away in the sink. He didn't feel clean. The Zujin had planted his feet firmly on the side of the presser, and he knew that he could never join his people now. He turned to off his sink inside a few minutes later. Lan was in his kitchen cooking a meal for himself. His blinds were drawn shut, and the TV cranked all the way up to drown out the riots. Tomorrow, he had to be back on the front lines. The days were all melting together, barely paying attention to the time anymore. In his drowsy state, Lam didn't notice a wife noon until he scooped the green onions he had been cutting. Indifferent, the policeman merely let out the wound bleed out. Lam wanted to feel something, preferably something other than pain. But even pain was better than feeling nothing. That's true. A confrontation. Oh, God. Uh-oh. From within Komai's office, a frantic argument could be heard. Resonating through the hallways were unmistakable voices of Kono Miyazaki and Komai himself. Inside the office, various items from the desk lay scattered across the floor, and Komai stood prone behind it. Miyazaki stood across from the room, his fist bald. You snake, Komai has. You fumbled our plans. Why can't you admit it? I specifically asked you to divert the Mangyo delegation. We had a hotel planned out for them to be contained at blank. You agreed we needed them isolated. Miyazaki looked unperturbed, eyeing Komai straight on without a change in expression. I told you already. I have no knowledge of such plans. You don't need you need to calm down immediately, Mr. Komai. Miyazaki said firmly, I couldn't have possibly agreed to have done such a plan because it would not be the IJ's jurisdiction. As a role of Guangdong's internal security bodies to provide protection to visiting dignitaries, Kamai laughed derisively. That was in your assessment a week ago, throwing himself on his desk chair, he buried his hands in his hands. His head in his hands. I have explicit orders from Tokyo to allow the visit of Mangyo delegation to go unimpeded, Miyazaki responded. Kamai sighed. Imprisoned in my own office is Mangyo's and, and Samishima's. They pulled strings. They made this happen, Kamai said. Miyazaki looked on stone face. Played like a fool. Lockdown. Overnight, the city appeared to be doubled weight in concrete. Oh, I read this before. Lockdown. Even this, please go ahead. Our path is set. Oh, Battle of the Junction. The Russian CCL raids. We can only choose this because government spares about 60%. Um, if you're on this one, please go ahead. End of the line. Come on, sits uh, stiffly in his chair. Uh, tearing forward in the director of Samijama's eyes. His fingers gripped the arms of his chair tightly, aching with the pain that he was numb to. Breaking the tense silence, Sejima spoke out. We're not happy, Komai. The king has invested a lot of money in Guangdong, and it's a mess outside. A mess you concealed. Yeah, the situation is difficult. More difficult than I initially anticipated, but... I don't want to hear it, Sejima snapped, before quickly recovering his calm. I don't want to hear it, but you're lucky, despite the disappointment of Tsukingi and your work here. It is Mangyo's view that you should be allowed to stay. Consider a test, and besides, it would be far more disruptive to replace you. Samajima rose from his seat, walking towards the door out of the office. As he reached the door frame, he turned his head towards Komai once more. Make no mistake, Komai. You'll no longer be granted full reign of Guangdong. You've been too much of a liability already. Without waiting for another reply, Samajima left, leaving Komai to grind his teeth and reflect on his failures. From this, there will be no real return, and we know what you know. See him press his door to seal envelope, serotipitous wiretaps, and the ever-present eye of the street informer. These are the tools by which the chief executive keeps tabs on the pulse of the people, their fears, doubts, half-baked plans. They ever forget of their own pearl that Hitachi hears all, Hitachi sees all, Hitachi knows all. Our path is set. Somehow, Kawhi forgot how beautiful Hong Kong could be. He was out there on the balcony after a late dinner. It was meant to be a quick smoke break, but all those tall illuminated buildings were reminders of how much he had achieved in those last few years. My news of Kamai's greatness, at least before the rioters tried to bring everything down. There wasn't any urgency now, so he lit a cigarette, took a puff, and stayed for a bit, soaking in the surroundings. The view was once better, he thought. Some of the buildings, though it was mainly on the fringes of the city, still had no light even now. If you were attentive, and Kamai was, you could smell the smoke from the fires before you even noticed them. This is also futile, too. Oh, how, how they wounded Guangdong, how they tried to burn this precious pearl to the ground, but she would not be, be, she would be brought back. Eventually, Kamai didn't know why, but he was extremely confident that all the rioters' efforts would eventually be futile. After all, wasn't the chaos already being brought under control? Weren't the police in Camp Otai significantly? Everything in Guangdong was born of his doing, and it was still very much in charge. He was uh, Kamai Kinichiro, the chief executive. <clears throat> he was the first, best, only option. A few minutes later, he put out a cigarette, snuffed it out by the door. When he went back, he was full of resolve to do what he must. There was no other plan, after all. Reward GFT turncoats, huh? Keep them down. Wow, look at this one. Decrease Japanese J Japanese frustration. Increase Zushin support, too. Wow. Wait, so what is this one? Besiege in neighborhoods. Decreases strength. Increases government control. Drastically can increase Japanese frustration. But we gotta save political power here for the product cycle. At least somewhat. 
Should be close to getting some of these riders down, right? Right of the edge. <coughs> this will strengthen the CCL. Um, well, it wasn't quite the coast you have myth and post guard, but you could see it from Ng Hui Sung's little store. Great gray slabs in the distance, nearly fade to the edge of the horizon. Small twinkles of light dance from them at night, the message of unknowable alien stars. At one turn, right, I walk down the low road a little, won't see the remnants of that all once been. Most abandoned, all decrepit, but there is nonetheless. Small slab, and par partially reclaimed, connected only by the thin dirt roads, is a revival, even their bones feel like a quiet miracle, if only for the sanctity of the dead. Eng's own rules are between the two, never quite fitting to both. A tangled mess. Of an improvised architecture, standing amidst rows of dingy five story courtyards, apparently built to rot. Ng bought bags of rice from the surviving farmers and sold them packs of batteries for the radios in return. She paid the right people protection, and if they went one oh, day, went away one day, she paid a different set of the right people. The government dragged people off of the factories now and then, but she'd been lucky so far, Hong Kong. The place where they're theoretically a part of didn't care about them, and so a little might have been paid in return. Up until a few weeks ago, of course. The delicate balance of violence Ng had relied on was broken by the arrival of a large group of desperate looking people from the inner city. Many are with all in their hair trigger tempos. The, then the lockdown came, and Ng's dwelling in Paul's stock became even thinner, and fights over the counter became a daily encounter. Even after the bus full of police followed, now she cowed under her own counter. And the police and the exiles chased and shot each other through the border territories on certain streets, wrecking them as they came. She prayed for it to end soon. She's now with a bullet and knife, please. That sucks. Ah, here's this one. Yeah, it's good. Bring to measure. <coughs> the men in the shadowy alley out of the back of the antiquated store filled with their stinking rubbish bins and various vagrants, sleeping vagrants. Someone passed around a pack of cigarettes, of course, and everyone took one, welcome relief after weeks of fighting. The government is stepping up its arrest, John said. They're sending hordes of policemen through every major rail station and bus exchange for at least once every couple hours. It's almost impossible now to move around in daylight without fighting police or corporate security. Can you get supplies to Cordon's? One of the GFT supporting shopkeepers asked. For the moment, General Plow, but her cells need all the equipment they can get. Arm clash is becoming more common, it's harder to replace just men. We've got stuff, another shopkeeper said, nudging the boxes outside him. Guns and body armor. Corporate quality, that's all we could ask of get in short notice. So it's an impressive haul, Chun commented, gazing down at the sleek rifles. Well, the shopkeeper replies, smiling slightly, smiling slightly. We haven't gotten to the wholesale massacres yet, but we'd rather be prepared for when we do get there. Give those dude cops a nice surprise. This beautiful nation. Our chief executive is Guangdong's strongman. As authority over this doubt is not to be questioned by anyone, let alone by traitors who rightfully ordained police in life is to do what they are told, not bothering to question why or how. Nor should his ability to protect this glorious, beautiful state of Guangdong and her welfare and prosperity be held in any doubt. Ooh. The esteemed gentlemen and officers of the Imperial Japanese Army, close and esteemed allies of Chief Executive Komai Kun and Chiro, have attempted to express concern about the situation in the streets of Guangdong by this message. The government of Guangdong shall make clear that they have no need to worry. By hook or crook, no matter the cost of the lives of money, Chief Executive Komai will do his duty by Guangdong and the Emperor and ensure that everything goes to plan. House always wins. Look at this. Chun and two compatriots sat at a table in a burned out building, idly tossing dice back and forth. Kids sat in the corner furthest from the elements, still fiddling with the radio. They picked up nothing but different cadences of static. The disc. Or dice clattering around and around the bowl, each time coming up with different numbers. Maybe they meant something, maybe they didn't. No one was keeping score or even playing any real game. Same as it ever was. So I think I read this before, so. Uh, if you want to read this one, please go ahead. Yeah. Because it's sufficiently within the CCL, the dismantlement proceeded smoothly. Nice. Because we dealt with the GFT's strength and radicalism will have increased. So like, when I did play Zibuka, I tried to dismantle the CCL first, and that ended horrendously for me, but this time it worked well. Hey, get more political power, which we could use. Decrease Japanese frustration by 30%. Actually, that's pretty good. If that's the case. Well, I'm going to really need to increase Japanese frustration at all. So. That's actually really good for us. He's going to control. Well, if we're moving five days. Uh, uh, okay, I can do that one. Castle Let Go Seat. Oh, look at that. The lists. The noise of the riots were everywhere. Subversion abounded, and it was impossible to do one's work in peace when the headquarters of the Guangdong police were four protesters, who Police Commissioner Tsushida Kuniyasu was convinced were all backed by the Nanjing government, besieging with their vulgar slogans day in, day out. The police were therefore forced to operate in darkened safe houses, as if they were the same sort of police that had put Guangdong in its present situation. Described as this, but knowing there was no other option, Tsushida Kuniyasu slung dossiers on a large table in a room ringed by radio and telephone apparatuses. See here, I've got names, aliases, locations, everything we could possibly need to find and eliminate ringleaders and those responsible for those protest subversive movements. We need to move quickly to restore orders, did you hear me? 
People silently nodded and grabbed the papers, moving to radios and telephones to issue orders. As orders were barked out, she observed a sudden rise of determination amidst his subordinates in the room, and uh, they were now closer than ever to finding the responsible for the chaos. Those who were responsible. Words from within, batons of gunfire without. These would scare Guangdong once more as they all had done before him. Hey, yeah, better competition power. As you can tell, this is a long episode, so. Cool. And we'll try again with them, but before we do that, let's save just in case, because I'm sure I'm going to make a mistake here, too. Um, but we got only, like, a few more focuses actually to go through that are unique to this side of the tree, and it would be up to me to really just finish off the riots. So far, it's going a lot better than the Ibuka campaign I did, for some reason. All the King's Men. And where are we at? So, frustrations, you know, which is pretty good. Panic is widespread, though. Mm -hmm. So how much? We have none. Fifteen. Well, we can do ten probably. It's fine. Just do ten. That's it. That's all we're gonna do. Brainstorming. <coughs> uh, a couple hours ago, the words on the pages stopped swimming and started line dancing. Lam had to fight physically to keep his head from crashing into his desk, but he couldn't stop his arms from shaking or his thoughts from dissipating every three seconds. He couldn't for the life of him get anything out of these phone intercepts. His page, page buzz caused him to the captain's office. Lam got up slowly, nearly falling over the process, and trudged to the station, seemingly only faces drawn with fatigue. What do you have? said the captain, who touched the man, snapped at him. Nothing, Lam replied to Simon. The intercepts don't seem to reveal any pattern. I. The fist flashed in front of his eyes, and suddenly he was on the floor, groaning. At that point, he wanted nothing more than just stay there and go to sleep. Or stay there. The enraged face of his captain materialized above him. Nothing, he shrieked. Nothing. Look outside, you moron. Does it look like nothing is going on outside? They're using code, you useless piece of crap. Tell everyone to bring their tables together and work on the intercepts collectively. Get up, you lazy son of a gun. Lamb climbs unsteadily to his feet, managing a salute and stumbled back out the door, giving it their all. Names, 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 names. I sent the police and the security troops to do away with the riders from without. We also employed deployed an assortment of informants, spies, and agitators to infiltrate the ranks, eating away at them from within. The duty has been twofold. First, they have leaked out any and all useful information they find of the government. Second, they successfully undermined any plans our pro the protesters came up with. As the protesters are solicited from both sides, inside and outside, at last things began to collapse. It is time for us to begin the work of mopping up. We cannot do that if we do not know the names of the renegades and subversives that sent Guangdong into this heckish downward spiral accordingly. Our agents and the police officers will be directed to find the names of any and all ringleaders and people of interest who the government can arrest, charge, and bring to justice. Nintendo, 1989-1972. What was Nintendo? An up-jumped playing card manufacturer, a uh, would-be instant rice magnate, a failed landlord of pimps, and unfaithful spouses. With a half-empty bottle of shoku on his desk and radio turned, tuned to some inconsistent government propaganda, Yamachi Horoshi wallowed in pity and confusion. He slouched in his seat, not thinking of the riots or Hitachi or Guangdong. All he could think about was what to put on Guangdong's headstone. It could have been so much more. That was the promise of Guangdong, after all. That success was a button here for the savvy and the courageous. Yamachi followed the promise of a, a opportunity, an easy capital from the whole islands. But from the start, he'd only known failure and disgrace. What little victories he had were fleeting or tainted. All he left now was a building and some tools, and he was desperately trying to find buyers for both. Then came what ifs. What if he'd been more ruthless, followed the adventure and example all the way to heck? What if Itachi wasn't here at all? What if Sony could have uplifted the Chinese in Zhujin, made them happier and more productive? What if Masashita could have kept the money taps from the Japan flowing, kept the pearls of Washington foreign capital? What if Fujitsu could have fostered brilliance, encouraging them to excel and innovate? Yamachi did not live in those worlds. He lived in Itachi's, where he was drunk, measurable, and had Aikoku Koshin Yokyoko on repeat to drown out the chaos beyond his office. Confused optimism. Try to assert itself. Yamashi still had his assets, money, and investments in safer places. Perhaps he still had a chance here, but it left as quickly as it arrived. What opportunities were left? Perhaps even in Hitachi's world, a world of violence and misery, Nintendo could still have found a niche. But we failed and now sink into heck. We know what you know. Steam presses to reseal envelopes, serotipitous wiretaps, and in the ever present eye of the street informer. These are the tools by which the chief executive keeps tabs on the pulse of the people. Their fears, doubts, and half baked plans. They forget at their own pearl. That Hitachi hears all, Hitachi sees all. Hitachi knows all, but a stalwart society. The virtuous and steadfast people of Guangdong, I speak to you with the passion and gratitude of my heart. Every day, we contribute to the stalwart society, a society of loyal and honorable citizens who strive to achieve great goals with the utmost diligence. The thunderous voice of Kamaik and Chiro blared through the bim built speakers within the television attached to the tile wall of the eatery, overlooking the rather empty establishment around noon. A car was tossed gently onto the wooden table, the odor of cigarette smoke permeating through the, out the air. Another one of these, a man breathed out an, op an opaque puff of. Uh, smoke tapping the ember infused ashes onto a plastic ashtray. You think the government's going to actually help me or help us? 
I heard they're good to bring the stick down hard on the workers soon, of course. I just hope they're not too harsh. The grainy visage of the chief executive displayed upon the screen caught their collective attention for a brief moment. Remember to help defend the state from the growing tides of chaos and terrorists plaguing our sheets. Report all instances of dissent you witness. We'll get through this together, and we shall emerge from a time of hardships into continued and sustained prosperity. The words of Kamaya chode on as the men returned to the card game, one of them shuffling haphazardly straight in the cards upon the table. I think they just want us not to cause any trouble. The police already have the place full and don't want any more rabble rallers coming around from the rest of us. The man cursed under his breath as he drew a couple of cards. And my compatriots, always remember, remain calm and composed, and we will resolve the issue, and your safety is our top priority. Turbulence and tumult, of course. Goliath strikes. Roll call was getting, uh, at the cell health court, was getting more depressing by the day. Each morning brought new disappearances, new arrests, new inspections, and break ins. In the common room, Chun sat with one of his comrades and listened to the latest stories of Tachi Brutality. It used to be that if the police came in, they'd rough you up a bit and throw some things around and then leave, the CCL man said, staring at the table. No, they'll beat the crap out of you, tear down your walls, and burn your furniture. It's too much. Guys from the CCL and GFT are being forced underground, breaking contact, or falling apart. Have faith, Joan replied, trying to force an air of confidence. We back hard for every man we lose. We know we've been giving the police and Hitachi thugs heavy losses in our districts. It's not enough, his comrades said in a voice so low as almost a whisper, and Chun knew he was right. What if they came for his family next? Sure. Hi and Wei were, uh, Hey and Wei were living in the dis dissented-run district, but the government was throwing more at them with each passing day. How long until someone beat down the door in the dead of night? Chun looked away and tried not to shiver. Things come to a head, and the house always wins. Our chief executive is a father and protector of the nation. His ability to protect the glorious, beautiful city of Guangdong and her welfare and prosperity cannot be held in doubt. Nor indeed should his authority ever, this delta, be questioned by anybody, let alone the traitors who rightfully have ordained a place in life to do what they are told, not bother to question why or how. And if no longer held in doubt, the protesters have diminished from their once genuine concerning peak. What could have generally affected the regime change in how pathetic, radical, and rapidly dwindling in numbers? Moreover, the general population holds the honorable chief executive in a fearful reverence of respecting his successful handling of both crises. Come on, Kira holds both loyalty and the fear of the people. He might have been happier if he had the uh, adoration too, but what he has, has is more than sufficient to hold on to his rightful position as chief executive, so he'll make do and move forward. The game was rigged from the start, the criminals didn't figure it out until it was too late. We've got some comments to go through too, but a shattered idol. Yoshiko was staying in a hotel room again, all her worldly possessions dumped in the pile across the floor. She sat on the edge of the, her bed, gazing numbly at the TV, which was playing Chief Executive Kamai's address to the nation. <coughs> As Kamai told his platitudes and lies, Yoshiko found her memory straying back to the past, when she and her father fled to Guangdong. It had been a radio then, not a TV, but other than that, the situations could have been identical. Her hope, a sense of self, the certainty of her old life, all laid discarded in a heap on the floor with her clothes and toiletries. Watching Kamai's disgusting foe smile fill her TV screen, Yoshiko knew her old life was done. If they were ever allowed outside again, there'd be in the walled enclaves they touched but for them where they could all be monitored and looked after. Drawing out in the Chinese district would mean a certain death. Kamai would have pr to provide for them. The price exacted for his protection would be heavy. The Japanese might well regain control of southern China, but they would only be kept to Hitachi's whim. The monster with ice for blood was lying to her face on TV and now held her life in, his, in the palm of his hand. The old world vanishes amidst smoke and fire. How much uh, Japanese frustration do we have? Eh, it's not much. Uh, Japanese despair, frustration. We want more government despair. Mm. Decrease government despair. Despair, but that's a lot of corruption. So, oh, no thanks. Product cycle two days, of course. Close out of that one. Economy wise, we know what you know. Not great. Really not great. And despite all its toils, our chief executive is Guangdong strongman. Uh, did I read this one earlier? I might have. But his authority over the Delta is not to be questioned by anyone, let alone the traitors who rightfully ordain his place in life to do what they are told, not bothering to question why or how. Nor should his ability to protect the glorious, beautiful city of Guangdong and her welfare and prosperity be held in any doubt. The most honorable Japanese expatriate community have approached the government and the legislative council of the state of Guangdong to express their worry and fear about the state of affairs in the country. The concerns are legitimate, but this message shall make clear that despite everything, the matter remains fully under control, one way or another the other. Chief Executive Komai will make sure that none of the toil and money they have invested in this country is brought to nothing. Our troubles are temporary, our potential is infinite. Which gives the Japanese frustration even more. Oh, so we can increase it even higher. Okay. Ah, that's what I want to do. Decrease Japanese. Decrease. The Green Trail. Um, if you want to read this one, please go ahead. Well, we can try this one. So comments include, can you do the IJA Hitachi Path? Uh, what is a IJA Hitachi Path? Like, I don't know how to get the IJA, like, coup. Like, I don't know how to do it. I could probably look it up, but still. Oh. Well, we failed again, so. If you want to this one, please go ahead. That sucks. 
I've been doing. I've been doing. Let's do it. Why not? <laughs> so with the uh, what do we have here? The HM one twenty one A modular de demodular wrap rapid data encoding and decoding a thousand kilobits per second. Nice. Not bad. We're still selling to the Germans. It's just so profitable. We have to. And we'll do. I don't see where we're at after that. Happy Juno. Someone says, May it survive the labor riots of 71. I'd like to see Guangdong under the Kumai executive. Someone said, Kumai made a good move by contacting his colleagues from Manchuria because now the economy's back on the good tracks, but the angry people have poured into the streets and they shall be crushed. Also, from what I saw, the do as I say path is for the personalistic ending, and the not as I do path is for the Manchurian ending. Uh, but I might be wrong about that. I thought this one would be like this one because not as I do. I don't know. I always thought like the left side was like the the, the uh, puppet path. So another comment said, after Kamai, I can do the Tino so called Sony Plus eventually, eventually. And someone says, as a mature executive tries to save Guangdong out of doom and gloom, the dissidents took to the streets in mass, threatening to dismantle his throne. They've been built for years. It's time to see whether Kamai is really just a Manchurian or the second coming of Caesar by moonlight. I'm oh, gonna do this one, please, guy too. I'm really only just here at this point now to uh. uh you can try to smell them again. It's going to take me forever to do, but um, really just to read the focuses and fight this as much as I can. We'll survive. Our chief executive is Guangdong's strongman. Wait, did I read this one again? Oh. Yeah, I, I thought I read this one before. I should have so the top paragraph is the same, but the honorable and lion Zhujin Japanese community, who forsook the backwards culture of the traitor's former relatives now riding the street to embrace his superior, more advanced way of life, now live in fear of, that the madmen and renegades besieging the cities of this beautiful land will bring their efforts to naught. Let us be clear, everything is under control. The honorable chief executive Kumai Kinachura will make sure that the sacrifice of the Zhujin community, Zhujin community will remain worth their while. Exunt. No day went by in Guangdong without protests, of course. Thousands of unruly riders were all on the street still, trying their level best to bring down the entire government alone. Or altogether. Many were still filled with the same rage, the same fear that caused this entire mess to begin with. But now there was something different. A few weeks ago, the government was centers in the three pearls was practically war zones, ground zero in the conflict. They're not closer to citadels, every single square inch in these places were now always watched by the faceless uniformed men. It was these men who were caught unaware in the beginning, but that had changed. The police in Camp Bai Lack were more equipped, more experienced, and certainly more ruthless. Against finer opposition, the protesters stumbled. Slowly they found themselves pushed further away from the real places of power, where all the anger in the world wouldn't cause as much damage as it had in the past. Kumai saw all of this from his balcony. The slogans always shouted at full volume were absent. The graffiti, graffiti was slowly being painted over. The riders were being dealt with, dead or in prison, and it didn't matter. All across the night sky, the lights were on again, a sign as sure as any that things were normal again. He took a satisfying puff from his cigarette, examined the city under him. A small smirk formed at the corner of his mouth. Yes, the rank and smell of smoke and filth was still incredibly pervasive. And there was so much to repair, but the chaos was over. All those thanks to the chief executive's leadership, as we do have half a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and, uh, caffeinated. Cool. Oh, let's close out of this one. Spiral. The bell rang and Lamb staggered into the break room. <coughs> he closed his eyes and collapsed into one of the station's cots, warm and stinking from the constant use. Screams and visions of violence entered his mind. Broken bones, shattered jaws, burning buildings, all revolving around him like a pack of demons. Nice one. He watched himself from above. A rider screamed at him, called him a traitor, a whore for the Japanese. He watched himself swing a baton full force into the rider's neck with a sickening crunch. The rider fell and didn't get back up. For me, it didn't look like self-defense, as a helmeted monster carved his way through the hordes of desperate civilians. Who is he, he wonders dully, watching himself beat and kill and maim. If only could stop, but the police were terrified of infiltrators, and so their service pistols were all locked away until the next time they had to go out and kill more people. But would he do it? If he had his gun in his belt right now, would he put his head to put it to his head and pull the trigger? Nah. Cowardice, self-preservation. The realization that his own death would be meaningless, and Hitachi's infernal engines would roll on with or without him. When the riders came for him, he refuses to die, he fights to death, defending himself. When he's alone, nobody is there but help. But him and the gun in his hand, he's too scared. Such is the curse of all the Zhujin in Guangdong. Kamau's rabbit hound set into the streets to spell blood and destroy lives. No way out. Oh. And we'll try to dismantle them again, but honestly, I don't think it's going to happen. I want to get through the product cycle first. And what is deserve rest. Li Chun. I've been awake for 30 hours. The last drop of adrenaline in his system dissolved, and he felt like the cumulative weight of his lack of sleep crashed upon him at all at once. He still felt content and knew when he awoke he would be energized. It was not a double shift in the fact for a little extra pay. It's a collective struggle to make life better for the people of Guangdong. He sat in the dark uh, safe house, eyes closed, uh, wondering just how rejuvenated he would be after the four hours of sleep he could afford. 
and half slumber, he wondered how tired the other side was. Were the traitors and collaborators exhausted as he, oppressing the fellow countrymen? To combine force, feed them all amphetamines to make sure, make them tireless and aggressive. <coughs> he had heard rumors, knew of some of his comrades were thinking of experimenting, but Chun still had reserve, reserves of energy left, and he knew he needed them for the days ahead. It was a war of attrition, he came down who collapsed from exhaustion first. Chun blinked out of his half sleep. He forgot about the gun in his hand. It was light now. He finally used it to its weight. Used to its weight. Though still struggled with its operation. He pulled open the cylinder, empty, fortunately. Put the gun down and went back to sleep. Suddenly aware that there was one bullet in his pocket. He would never be parting, parting with it. It was a special bullet. As for a special target. But the target closed his eyes and thought of the family he could protect with that single bullet. Leading by example. If you want to bet this, please, good head. Oh, we don't want one, why not? Despite all the toils, we'll survive. Time running out. A few minutes of the phone lines that connect to feel like an eternity to come I. Uh... We'll do that one. Um, he could feel his heart beat rapidly. A cold sheen of sweat having formed on his forehead. It had been much too long since he had last reported back to the mainland. He couldn't possibly risk someone thinking that he mismanaged the situation. The line clicked and the grinning voice came through the other end. Chief Executive, it said, not without a hint of derision. Come on, his teeth. Yes, it's me, he said breathlessly. My apologies for taking so long to report back, and the situation over here has left me so many, with many more extraordinary duties to attend to that I would normally be exempt of. Has it, replied the representative, derision of it in his tone. We are receiving reports of widespread chaos across the streets. Private divisions are being negatively affected by this, and our investors are starting to worry, Chief Executive. You understand? Come on, reflectively gulped, yes, he said, a voice wavering in his throat. We are well, very well aware of the situation. The police have been pursuing the rioters mercilessly. Even now, the camp are dispersing them, and orders will soon be restored. I swear to you, I will not allow these hooligans to burn down everything we've worked for. They'll be dealt with, I just... He paused, catching his breath. I need more time. The representative only hums slightly before replying. Very well, we'll give you your time, Kumai. Do not disappoint us. And with that, the line cut off, leaving a breathless Kumai sat alone in his office, the darkness creeping closer by the second. The rope gets cut ever, ever shorter. The slips. If you want to do this, please go ahead. Despair is hopeless, huh? Nice. Location. Let's get this done now. Get her done, crumbling. Oh. <coughs> what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? Grumbling, one of Wise classmates was sitting in the living room, just having dashed over her from the quiet neighborhood to deliver food and supplies. Some of the families living in the riot zones were doing very badly, she said, and a group of students had banded together to make sure everyone was doing okay. School probably won't open again, by the way, she said, as Hei and Wai dug into some pork rolls. The Chinese Zuzhen teachers are all rioting, and the Japanese ones are running. Many of the students are rioting as well. A few of her classmates have been picked up over the last couple weeks. We don't know what's happened to them. Wai was horrified at the news, but some cynical part of her was unsurprised. The government wasn't even bothering to deliver me out of the neighborhood anymore. It would be far greater to expect Hitachi to invest significant resources in educating Chinese rebels. We have to go and find Chun, Wai said finally, turning to Hei. We just can't sit back and wait for the executioner's blade to fall. Is it not better to go out fighting? I don't know where Chun is, Hei, Hei replied, staring morosely at his half-eaten bun. He doesn't want us involved, so he never told us where he went. So he, he wants us all to stay safe. At that point, all Wai could do was sob and hope that some merciful god of any existence would come down and vaporize Komaki and show up on the spot. But, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Then Pickens. We're starting interrogations. God dang it. Yeah. We're living our grasps, of course. We'll survive. The uh, Valley of Unity. <coughs> he shifted the factory over. Chow sh staggered out of the warm, into the warm night air. It was a faint yet noticeable scent of smoke in the air, probably more fires. One of his cousins had seen his apartment burned down the other week. As he trudged homeward through the streets, the cheery jingles and slogans of the government's pan-Asianist propaganda assailed him from the whole way, disordered through the radio speakers. Would it would be nice, he thought, if only everyone here saw themselves as an Asian first. The ethnic lines between the Chinese and foreign overlords had never been firmer. A Japanese person venturing into a Chinese district meant a ba being at best, a disappearance or worse. If a Chinese person walked into a Japanese district, the police would assume that they already killed someone and arrest him. As he was crunched on something that wasn't pavement, he saw a torn up piece of paper drifting around his feet. More propaganda, photographs of Japanese and Chinese children playing together, they must have been burned by the protesters. Chow had no love for the Japanese occupation, no one here did, but it did take two sides to fight a war. Was it an unjust piece really worse than the turmoil the country now found itself in? If the rioters won, wouldn't that just invite more direct repression from Japan? The ideal dies on the altar of reality. C'est la vie. 
Not good. 100 more days for the product cycle. Because I'd like to read about the product cycle. Almost done. Oh, we have, oh, we have like two months left. Holy crap. That's going to be a quite a while, but that's alright. We'll get there. I'll still try to dismantle them no matter what. Yeah, you can't negotiate with them. But what do you expect? Excuse me. Alright, so time to go on, crack the facade, keep them isolated. Yeah, check his statements. Nice. Choice specimen, huh? Happy August, everybody. Transcript. Because it's off the street. We did that one before. I think we did both of these before. Check out it for uh, contacts. Why not? The outburst. There's that. Sure, I've exchanged a piece of the puzzle. Transcript. Follow well, the client list. We're going to go with this picture better be worth a thousand words. We'll go with that one. Ice cold. Crap. Well, waiting out there is a waste of time. It's good to know. Living our grasps. God dang it. Where's this one? Fine, we'll get him. Ah. A little bit of revolt over there. There's this one, the Ersatz Panopoli of War. Is there any of this? Please go ahead. And. Fritz Rage. Hey, there we go. <coughs> ah, modem. In a description, it seems that every week computer is becoming exponentially more powerful, but Hitachi has proposed something new. What if rather than building a more powerful individual computer, what if we could get more power by linking several computers together? The part of those experiments is the HM120-1A modem, which can link two computers together via transmission line, usually a telephone line, which allows exchanges of information to up to 120 bytes per second, much faster than a person can physically transfer the data. Modems are already in use, but only for limited, mostly military purposes. The HM device is the first one efficient and affordable enough to hopefully see widespread adoption for research and business use. Computers that talk to each other? Insane. So look at that growth. Not bad. I get more money, too. Let's take a look. Hey, actual positive growth. We have a surplus. What's not to love? All over now, baby blue. Lieutenant Iwano wiped the sweat off his brow and reached down for his walkie-talkie. There's a bloody handprint across his chest, so Iwano wasn't sure whose butt it was or when it had appeared there. So better than a bullet in the chest, like what uh, Ono oh in the corner had earned himself, as well as a significantly higher number of riders. The air was filled on both sides with hay, sides, groans, and curses. Team 1 leader containment. The meat wagons are arriving on scene. Can you get them safely through the coordinate this time over? A crack will fall. Containment at Team 1 lead shouldn't be a problem. The crowd's looking surely, but... Surly, but we have arms to hold them if need, if need be. What, that's it. what today, huh? Over? We can say that again. It's over. It's finally over. Soon I reckon I'll have the first decent night of sleep in. A globule of saliva flung itself at the bridge in Ivana's nose, twisting around. You can see the face of one of those student leaders, twisted in hatred and despair, while the rest of the GFT leadership try to look as downward as possible. Sorry, containment. One second, please, said Iwano, strolling towards the cuffed youth. Uh, his boot crunched through teeth. Iwano felt the nightmare lift. Because we heavily weakened the GFT, despite the radicalism being above 70%, the rate proceeded smoothly. The government holding control of the regions of Guangdong was crucial to the success. The GFT is no more. More government control, less Sushin support, decreased uh, government and Japanese despair and frustration. More political power. Beautiful. And we totally didn't use Kong's commands for this. Totally didn't. So. I guess we'll have to see what's next then. Um, the situation changes in four days. As much as the chief executive would wish some time would stand still, just as once the riots have an inertia of their own, take action out for the situation as escalates further, and empire of concrete and steel. In summary, Hitachi now possesses a controlling uh, stake in a 53 uh, like subsidiaries and has purchased shares in more than a thousand European construction firms. 
But Mike felt dizzy for a moment as his brain processed the full meaning of the statement. As Gammon had paid off, Hitachi was now unquestionably the face of the construction sector in Germany. Hundreds of hospitals, offices, railroad and metro stations, stadiums, and even monuments of Mr. Adolf Schmittler have been built by their hands. The Hitachi logo could be found along every boulevard in every German city, as it indelibly pressed into the psyches of the German population. This has proved the Perfect advertising campaigns, millions of Germans are now pouring into stores to purchase Hitachi brand and consumer goods. What started as a construction empire was rapidly transformed into the most diverse corporate enterprise in Europe. Come back and help us see history repeat. Germany had borrowed from Manchurian systems, planning to build a war machine that brought Europe to its knees. By now, they would import the corporation that was bringing the Manchurian system into its second era of greatness. He would make sure the Germans would never have to forget, never forget what the Manchuria had done for them. So now let's see what happens. Terminated, terminated. <coughs> The Freedom Riders. Oh, if you want to do this one, please go ahead. Smoke over ashes. If you close your eyes and listen, sitting in the quiet of the day, it was clear that the riots were over. Guangdong has endured many long weeks of blaring police sirens and loud bells that shouted slogans and unrestrained anger. They had only recently ended, but now they seemed so distant, so unreachable. When those discordant sounds disappeared, they were replaced by an uncomfortable and unnatural silence. But whether they're out of sense of duty or just because it felt like the right thing to do, the rhythms of life eventually returned to fill the void, and soon the vanish, silence vanished, replaced with a rather different set of sounds. All across the three pearls, you could hear the harsh, high scraping of posters being removed. The young men worked hard, heaving mounds of rubble and ashes to clear the streets, their beds of beads swept, fell in place where blood had once been shed, and of course, the little clunking of the factories in return, a constant metronomic heartbeat that confirmed that Guangdong was indeed alive again. The riots had left many scars across all society, and wouldn't be easy to repair with what, what could be fixed, heal what could still be mended, but slowly, surely, things were getting settled again, not into the old ways, though. Something had changed, and a new normal was beginning to emerge, and so, step by careful step, Guangdong marches into the future. Through all the tumult and chaos of the Guangdong riots, Chief Executive Kamai has skillfully reestablished control of the Guangdong through uncompromising handling of the riders. However, the influence of Nissan and Manchuria proved overbearing, and Kamai's Guangdong is nothing more than a replica. Oh, look at this. On the other side of returning to relative calm after the destruction wrought by the oil crisis, the Guangdong riots, brought about due to mass societal anger to the living in a segregated system, have at least calmed down. Tense negotiation with the government and a harsh crackdown have recently yielded calm on the streets of Guangdu Guangzhou and other major cities within the corporatocratic state. The chief executive has recently made a communique indicating total success and a vowed return to business one way or the other. Tokyo has indicated its congratulations from Nanjing. On the other hand, there is no comment. One less crisis then. So, our electing crown, or Dom. The air is cool, the sky is bright, the sun rises over the horizon, shining its bright, brilliant, golden rays of warm sunlight over the inhabitants of Guangdong and the three pearls. The gunfire and cries of the weeks prior have dissipated, being carried away by the quiet breeze. The streets are silent, devoid of riding workers in tattered clothing or police officers dressed in blue. Our chief executive emerges from his rifle seat, triumphant and victorious, golden laurels resting upon his head. Order and stability return to the delightful territories of Guangdong once more, and the plumes of opaque smoke have declared, and the orchestra of discord has been silenced. The chief executive Kumai, the future holds infinite possibilities and grander designs, a great magnificent future where the populace and assets of Guangdong are to be shaped according to his will. One where the po people remain loyal and obedient, their frustrations no longer hamper in the progress which they could have never seen or comprehend. The sun towers above the three pearls as with any other day, but this time, Helios heralds a new era of prosperity and success, one with no obstructions or obstacles. Kumai stands trumpet with Guangdong prostrate at his feet, but we're going to end the episode there and finish this part of the campaign in the next episode. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll finish out this part of the campaign for Komai Kinichiro. And look at how happy he is. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.